my name is Colleen Barzaga, and this is my TOK presentation. So, I'm focusing today on the Everglades snake infection. Not infection, <laughs> infestation. <laughs> and so, um, I'm going to show you guys a video that's basically going to explain the situation down in the Everglades. Pythons, an invasive species here in the Florida Everglades where pet owners will often dump their snakes once they get too big, or the pythons are escapees from nearby reptile farms. Either way, South Florida has a big problem with these very big snakes. Burmese pythons can grow 30 feet long and eat a six-foot alligator. Officials say there are tens of thousands of them in the Everglades. Now, hunters like George Guterres are being allowed to go after these constrictors. You look for changes in color, you look for shapes that don't fit in with the rest of the vegetation, you look for things that just seem out of place. To help get rid of the snakes, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is letting sportsmen hunt them on 700,000 acres of state land next to the Everglades National Park. This looks very, you know, <laughs> Alligators prey on small snakes, but are no match for a full-grown python. There are nine different species of invasive constrictors loose in the Everglades, including green anacondas, reticulated pythons, and rock pythons. All big snakes with no natural enemies. They not only compete with native panthers and alligators for food, but also prey on some critically endangered species like storks and wood rats. Fortunately, last winter's cold snap reduced the population by an estimated 40 to 50 percent. While we're fortunate to have had this cold weather, we know that there are still many pythons out there that are breeding and having babies. Since 1980, about one million constrictors have been shipped to the U.S., and the Department of the Interior says domestic breeders have raised at least that many for sale as pets. Two Florida congressmen want to ban the big snake trade. You gotta keep looking everywhere and under everything because you never know when they're gonna be there and what you're gonna find. In 10 years, wildlife experts have caught and killed about 1,200 pythons in Everglades National Park, where most of the invader snakes have taken up residence. But sportsmen like Guterres are not allowed to hunt there. We need access and we need firearms, the ability to go in and take care of the problem and be part of the solution. When he's not hunting snakes, Guterres is a personal injury lawyer with the ever-present Blackberry. Yeah, the guy's getting deposed next week and uh, we're in good shape. Guterres has had better luck finding clients than pythons. Other hunters are coming up empty too. <laughs> the six-week season ended in April. Hunters did not report a single snake kill to the State Fish and Wildlife Commission. There are snakes that are crossing over here from Everglades National Park, but uh, you're going to have a lot better chance of, of, of controlling the population if you go south. A gravid female python can lay 100 eggs, and Florida officials have done the math. They will extend the season next year from six weeks to six months. For Assignment Earth, this is Bruce Burkhardt. That's basically um, what's been going on in Florida for many years now. And so this isn't common news in Florida. <laughs> Snake hunter bagged 17 foot, 130 pound Burmese python in Florida. Um, the shocking moment a python crushed a 60 pound um, pet Siberian husky to death. Um, parent faces 35 years in jail after hungry eight foot pet python kills two year old um, daughter. So, um, Basically, the, effect, the effects of these snakes being, um, being um, released in Florida is that they prey on endangered species and they're thus harming the environment. You bio kids should know a lot more about this than I do. Um, the rate of growth is becoming an e even a, a threat to people, so people have to be careful of, uh, even more vigilant of their children and of their pets 
because um, these pythons get so big that they can easily eat their kid and snatch them up. And so, since there's already so many snakes like let loose in the country, in the in the state, people just um, keep on releasing their exotic animals, such as like their pythons, because you know who's going to notice one more snake? And um, so, the South Florida Water Management District, which is a government agency, it is not to be confused with private agencies that are um, that are paying people to kill snakes. Um, they were created to remove snakes, so like their taxes are going towards that as well. And more people are becoming hunters because hunters would earn fifty dollars per python for up to four feet, and then plus an extra twenty-five for every um, additional foot. So the guy who caught seventeen, like the seventeen-foot-long um, python, he earned a lot of money during this. And if they find the python with the eggs, they get a hundred extra dollars because you know they lay up to hundred eggs. And then the Python Challenge is also an event that they hold every year where they invite um, amateur, amateur hunters to compete in hunting for these pythons and for these snakes out in, in the restricted area. And so the person, the person who, gains, who you know, catches the most snakes wins, but every hunter gets to keep their snake, um, the snake meat and the skin. So this brought me to my knowledge question. So what role does reasoning play in the justification of ethical values? So the positive claim for the snake situation, for the, uh, for the overpopulation of snakes in Florida and um, justification for killing them is that the reasoning in this case is being used mainly to support the act of hunting snakes in the Everglades because through math, science, and logic, we determined that it would not be beneficial to the environment to have that amount of snakes, and it's also a danger to our, to our children and our um, domestic pets. It also seems like a logical counter-argument to those who um, are extreme tree huggers and think no animal should be killed. And it's supposed to make profitable aspects um, to killing the snakes appear more reliable because such validation was deduced in a definite manner, so people see like, Oh, A plus B equals C. So. Then the negative, uh, the, neg the negative claim for um, the overpopulation of snakes is the reason we use, we receive from the information sources that we are predisposed to trust could simply just be manipulated in order to gain approval of killing snakes in the Everglades, because um, as we learned in Miss Katarina's, Google can filter out. Um, certain website, which websites you see, what information you can see, all that stuff. And then repeated reasoning makes one focus in only one type of in only one type of solution for the overpopulation problem instead of trying to determine more humane ways uh, to deal with the situation. So say um, a more humane way would be to just capture the snakes and try to try to find people who owners who can actually take care of them, put them in reservations or even um, sell them to other countries where people actually want the snakes, you know? And so my other real life situation was abortion in the US. And so what roles does reasoning play in the justification of ethical values? So we know that here in the US, abortion is a very controversial topic. Um, it's even caused laws and, and huge debates to be caused, to be caused and our presidential ele election was also affected by it. So the reasoning that conservatives or pro-life groups use to justify the choice of aborting the fetus or the child can be because abortion is technically murdering your child, um, they deserve, the children or the fetus deserves a chance to live, and women should be held responsible for improper use of contraception, thus they need to find a way to deal with the child or the aftermath of the birth, so decide whether they're going to go to adoption, whether they're going to be taken care of by another relative, by themselves, um, just different ways to deal with that. And then the reasoning that liberals or pro-choice groups use in the US to justify um, having, having a choice to an, to an abortion is that there's many women who physically and psychologically cannot have a child. If you are, um, if you are a woman and you're extremely mentally ill, you are, not, you are probably not capable or in the right um, state of mind to take care of a child and provide that child with, um, with, with its emotional needs. Or if you're physically ill, um, there's many women with heart diseases that if they cannot give birth to a child, even though their um, their reproduction 
system is capable of it, if um, once they go through childbirth, they're gonna have like a heart attack because of the immense pain, then um, abortion, they think that abortion is not murdering a person because it's still a fetus. It's not a developed child because after a certain um, point in the pregnancy, you cannot have an abortion because it's not only a danger um, to the child in that sense, it's also a danger to your body. And then not having abortions would cause unwanted children to be born. So these children, if they do stay with their, with their parents, their parents are probably not, um, are probably gonna be negligible of them or they're gonna end up in adoption systems, which we all know are not the best here in the US. And then my second real life situation is the creation of the Bless You Too. So, <laughs> so this is a really interesting one. This one, um, this is a robot created by the Protestant Church of Hesse and Nassau, located in Germany. And it's a robot which delivers blessings and um, <laughs> <laughs> he, re he reads from the Bible in um, five different languages, and he moves his arms around and flashes lights at you. <laughs> and so, um, could you play the video? Herzlich willkommen. Möchten Sie von einer weiblichen oder einer männlichen Stimme gesegnet werden? Gerne. Welchen Segen brauchen Sie? Segne dich und behüte dich. Er lasse sein Angesicht leuchten über dir und sei dir gnädig. Gott, erhebe sein Angesicht auf dich und schenke dir seinen Frieden. So, how this relates to my knowledge question, which is, what role does reason play in the justification of, eth of ethical values, is that from a positive point of view, um, in relation to the robot, is that um, the robot seen as more efficient, it's internationally friendly, and they can probably program it to have more languages available, so it's gonna be easier for someone from a different country or who still hasn't assimilated to that country to be able to, um, to still connect in a sense. Because obviously, if you're from mainland China and you just moved to, to Germany, you're probably not gonna find as many um, mainland um, or immigrant Chinese and um, churches or, or stuff like that. So that just makes it easier for people in that type of situation. And it's also less social interaction for people who have social anxiety. So um, that's, that one's good. And then the negative positive uh, point of view would be that it takes away a sense of community, uh, usually um, within these Christian branch, um, Christ the branch of Christianity. Um, people usually believe that God sends messages to people. This is a robot configured by a person to send a message, so it's not God. And um, it's also a distraction from the actual purpose of going to church, which is to be connected to God. Because if you're just focusing on like this robot that's going like this and like <laughs> flashing lights at you, and also he changes his eyebrows if you saw, it's it's very distracting in a sense. So, my um, my t my t my stand on the on my knowledge question that I created: What role does reasoning play in the justification of ethical values? Is that reasoning is essential to back up an argument um, for whichever with for whichever ethical value or any argument at all, really? And reasoning can be manipulated through the emission of information, such as like um. As I explained earlier, Google censors what um, what they want you to see and what they don't. Pe um, if a news, if the news just focuses on a certain aspect or a certain point of view of a story, you're never going to get the whole um, the whole information or the whole truth to it because you don't know the other sides of it. And um, they also use certain buzzwords or persuasive language in order to make you feel like, oh. This, this has to be the right one, this has to be the truth, without um, even be, it makes you less inclined to look for other information, to kind of debunk that. And in conclusion, people must be willing to do research about different types of reasoning used when justifying certain eth ethical values, even if they already agree with it. Because usually, we grow up with our ethical values, where um, our culture tells us from a small age with stories, with children books, movies, 
like what is right and what is wrong. So this is to make sure that that like that your actual opinion is coming through on the topic and it's not just some value that you randomly agreed with or you just um, agree with out of habit or because it's familiar to you.